It's in hindsight that we can learn to have foresight. Good morning, everyone. It's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out. In Genesis 50, 20, we can see that Joseph saw God's plan in hindsight. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, if we look at Joseph's life, we can see that maybe he came to this particular conclusion um, through all of his trials and tribulations. But did he really come to that conclusion, or did he know this beforehand? Think about Joseph's life. Why did he stick with the integrity that he did his entire life? Can you? I mean, he went through a lot, but he maintained his integrity. We remember as a child that he had a couple of dreams where his brothers would bow down to him. Uh, he had two dreams. And somehow he knew that even before the Torah was written, you know, Moses wasn't around yet. This is Genesis, right? that two or three witnesses were important. Now, here's the two dreams. In Genesis 37, 6 through 10, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou... in Deed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down? bow down ourselves to the to the earth now there's a lot we can learn from this passage joseph knew in his heart that god was going to fulfill this dream right he kept himself pure through all the tribulation that he was about to face now he probably should have kept the dream to himself if you'll notice in verse 8 it says they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words Okay, so if he kept the dreams to himself, it makes me wonder how his life would have turned out. Let us assume for the moment that Joseph simply pondered those things in his heart, uh, like Mary did when the shepherds told her they had received an angelic visitation and what they said in Luke 2.19. It says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, just looking at Mary's life compared to Joseph, there's not much written about Mary because what tribulation did she go through? So, if you think of Joseph's life, it's written. You know, he was thrown into a pit by his family. His family, through an act of, you know, God intervened somehow, sold him into slavery. They took him out of the pit. Then he was falsely accused of rape. He was thrown into prison. He interpreted a dream in prison using his godly gift, and he wasn't rewarded for it right away. Now, if you think about Mary, there's not much written about her. I went down that rabbit trail to point out that sometimes it's best to keep the promises of God a secret. You know, we may be molded in the fire. I'm not saying that for a fact that if Joseph kept those things a secret that he would not have gone through tribulation. But we do know that life and death are in the power of the tongue and we shall eat the fruit thereof. Loose lips sink ships. It's a secular phrase, but it's there for a reason. Now, if you have a gift, remember Joseph gave a dream to the butler and the baker. You may not see immediate results. And I, for some reason this brings me to Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Um, Be not deceived, God's not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Think of what Joseph sowed, right? Verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... 
we shall reap, comma, if we faint not. So Joseph kept doing well, and it looked like his crop was delayed. <laughs> you know, in verse 10, as we therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them of the household of faith. So Joseph went about doing good. You know, Jesus went about doing good too. Joseph had used his spiritual gift with the butler and the baker in prison, and the butler left him there to rot. And sometimes we're, we can be in our ministry and we can just go, man, you know, I'm using this gift. I just don't see it. And what we're wanting to do, the devil wants us to faint. But Scripture says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, you know, God's going to give us that increase. God spoke to Joseph in sheaves, and he also talked to him in the vernacular of astronomy, the stars, you know, the heavenly realm. And let me tell you something. The prophetic scares unbelievers. The butler was probably just afraid. He was blown away that there was something that could happen like that. I mean, you know, they're blown away. Howard's ministry in Houston, the OFCC, our Fellowship Christian Church, there's lots of miracles there, lots of people healed. Um, I've seen a, a person's eye straighten out, infertility, I've seen that go away. I mean, people we pray for. I was surprised. I mean, it, it blows me away. But what, his church should be really big, right? But when you operate in the prophetic, it kind of scares people off. I don't, I, I, that's just what happens. The, the prophetic gift, it confronts people with the spirituality of the Bible. And it's definitely needed in the body because people, a lot of people are sitting in the pews, they know about God, and they're just basically playing it safe, trying to get, it's called fire insurance, they're trying to do the least that they can to get into heaven. And then here comes this prophetic gift to the people sitting in the pews, the pew warmers, and then they're confronted with the very fact that God is real. I mean, God's a spirit, and that he's to be worshipped in spirit and truth, and you're not supposed to bury your talent, right? They may see healings and receive words of knowledge about their life, but they don't do anything. They're choosing the path of least resistance, which is basically rooted in carnal self-preservation. This carnal self-preservation, uh, we know, is a bad way of looking at things. It's a false sense of self-preservation in the sense of eternity. We need to worry about eternity, not just our lives here on earth. Now, I'm pondering Joseph's life. I often ponder how he maintained his integrity before God. He could have done like Job's wife wanted him to. You remember Job's wife said, curse God and die? He says something interesting in Job 2, 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, remember this is after all this stuff just happened to Job. I mean, he was going through a real rough time here. And here's what his loving wife says. Then his wife said unto him, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But see, that's the devil there speaking through his wife. You know, Jesus says, I've, I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. Those in your household will be your enemies. You know, this is what happens when you're confronted, when God is working in your life. You know, the devil may work in those people that are closest to you. It's, it's, it's just a fact. And then Job here, he says, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, Job and Joseph had similar stories in that they had lost everything, and they'd been forsaken by people that were dear to them. But they both maintained their integrity with the Lord. They didn't sin with their lips. In hindsight, we can learn how to have foresight. Let's fast forward to a dream interpretation that saved pretty much a lot of people. Um, you remember the famine that came in Genesis? It was Pharaoh's dream in Genesis 41. If you remember, he dreamed about the fatted cows eating the skinny cows and the grains and all that. But, but Joseph says something interesting. Because Pharaoh had two dreams, here's what he says in Genesis 41, 32. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice... It's because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, you remember Joseph had two dreams, right? And Pharaoh had two dreams. 
Joseph had something in his spirit, right? Joseph knew that Pharaoh having the two dreams meant it was established by God. That's what he says. He knew this before the Torah was written. He knew this before Moses was around. Joseph had a relationship with God. So he knew the two dreams he had as a boy were going to come to fruition if he fainted not. If he fainted not, he maintained his integrity. Now, Job knew that his future would be brighter with God than without him. He says something interesting, Job thirteen fifteen, Though he slay me, I will trust in him. Now, how does this apply to me and you? Now, I'm going to say something rather bold here, but one of the things that I like to do is, you know, ask, seek, and knock. It, it, it shows our persistence when... Uh, we struggle with the Lord. Bless me, Lord. We ha- Sometimes we have to maintain that struggle all night to get the blessing. Sometimes we park questions in the Spirit, and it may go, uh, we may get the answer immediately, like in Isaiah, before they, before they ask, I will answer. Sometimes I ask God something. Before I finish the sentence, He gives me the answer. Sometimes it's a decade, <laughs> right? So this may sound arrogant, but this is true of every believer, okay? This is true of every believer, If we abide in his word, we will be his disciples indeed. I'll show you the scripture. In John 8.31 and 8.32, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So notice here that if we continue in the word of God, Jesus is the word, and we continue in the things that he spoke, you know, we have access to him through the Bible, we shall know the truth, And, you know, the spirit of truth is a component here. We shall have an intimate relationship with the truth, and the truth will make us free. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. So we have to have a relationship with the person, Jesus. And like I said, he says, you'll be my disciples. Isn't that interesting? Every believer that abides in his word will be my disciples, Jesus says. So let's look back for a moment at the framework before the New Testament is written. Now we can this is before before Jesus comes, okay, the Messiah. You know what why we're sitting here we're sitting here in the two thousands, we're going, well why did the Jews re- re- reject Christ? Why did they do that? That's crazy. They've got Psalm twenty two, Isaiah fifty two, fifty three, they've got Daniel chapter nine. Come on, anybody can see that Jesus was the Messiah. But let's look at it this way. Now, put, her, put yourselves in the audience relevance of the time. Let's pretend that we're living in the times of the Romans, um, of the times of the Jews before Christ was crucified. Keep in mind Isaiah 52 and 53 and Psalm 22 and Daniel chapter 9. These were only a few passages of the entire sum of Scripture. Keep in mind, this is, Jesus has not started doing all this stuff yet. I mean, let's just put ourselves in the mindset of the Jews at that time. They were working with the best they had at the time. That you know everybody's doing the best they can with what they have. They were studying scripture just like Saul Paul, remember Saul was killing Christian Jews in the word of God to do so, but they did not have a relationship with the author of that scripture. They could have easily counted down from the building forth of the wall to Messiah would be 483 years, just like the wise men from the Babylonian captivity deduced when they came looking, though we seen his star, you know, they were uh, uh, in, interpreting the Genesis prophecy about the, the scepter. Um, they were counting down from the rebuilding of the wall, and where's the Messiah? And in Daniel 9.25, you know, easily know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild and restore and rebuild Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Jesus said, you didn't know the time of your visitation, right? They weren't paying attention. I mean, this may be harsh, but because they weren't... Um, Luke 19.42, let's just read it. If thou hadst known, if thou hadst known... Even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they're hid from your eyes. Whoa. Notice Jesus says something interesting there. They're hid from your eyes. 
For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee in on every side and they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus is prophesying the destruction of uh, of Jerusalem there in AD 70. It happened in that generation. He's talking to them. He says, your children, you know, they didn't know their time of their visitation when they could have Carnally speaking, they could have deduced it, right? Now, we see that in hindsight now, but imagine yourself back then, okay? Now, keep in mind, the top theologians, carnally thinking, could not nail it down. They couldn't get it. The majority of the people could not get the doctrine that the Messiah was coming, right? I'm going to tell you that the top theologians today probably don't have it right, if they do not have the Spirit of God. Okay? Romans 8, 9, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So we need to make sure that who we're listening to has the Spirit of Christ. If not, they're none of his. So coming full circle here, I want to, I want to show you something interesting. Something interesting. In Luke 25, through 27. There's a guy named Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, just and devout, waiting, waiting, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do so for it, him after the custom of the law. Now I want to tell you something interesting here. This is Jesus was just born. The Holy Spoke Holy Ghost was not yet given like it was in Pentecost in Acts chapter two. There are some references to the Holy Spirit. Remember this famous Psalm, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay? You'll notice that it was upon him but not in him. So there was a relationship Simeon has simply by waiting on God and then God cho- chose to speak to him through the Holy Ghost. He was waiting upon the Lord. He had a, uh, an idea of not my will, but thy will, Lord. Now, we don't know exactly how God revealed it to him precisely. Maybe it was like Jesus did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Okay, remember he opened up their hearts to the scriptures? It takes God to do this, guys. I'm trying this person, God, the Spirit of God. The scriptures all by themselves need to be illuminated by the Spirit. Okay, we know that the Spirit of God reveals truth. It will guide us into all truth. In 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Do you understand here? Paul is saying you cannot understand the spiritual things by, by, uh, without the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. So looking back here, in hindsight, looking backwards... You know, if, if we were at that time of the Pharisees and all that stuff, yeah, they were probably trying to do the best they can. Some of us, some of us sell them short, but I, I wonder if me and you were there and we didn't have the Spirit of God, you know, how would we look at things? And then eventually they were confronted with the spiritual. Jesus was doing miracles. He was doing prophecies. He was having words of knowledge. And it was freaking those religious people out. So when you're confronted with the prophetic gift, um, it's going to separate the sheep from the goats. That's what it does. So I may not know everything, but one of the things I do know is that we do have to have a relationship with the Spirit of Truth. In John sixteen thirteen, How be it, when He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all. All truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he'll, he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Just like he showed Joseph. The Spirit of God 
gave Joseph that dream. The Spirit of God gave Pharaoh, a heathen, that dream that needed a person with the Spirit of God to interpret it. The Spirit of God revealed to Simeon that the Christ was coming. Don't you want to have foresight like that? So in hindsight, we can look back and see that we need a relationship with the Spirit of God to have God-like foresight. I want to thank you very much for being a part of my life. Thank you for subscribing to ConradRocks.net. If you subscribe to the Inner Circle right now, there's a there's a series, uh, and this is August 2014, there's a uh, series on hearing God called Hindrances to the Truth. All you got to do is just send me an email. It's free for the asking. It's an audio podcast series. Um, you can also help out. Um, ConradRocks.net has PayPal. You can send me your prayer request as well. Conrad at ConradRocks.net. Please put prayer in the subject line so <laughs> so I can see it quickly. I get a lot in email. Um, also, if you're if you don't like using PayPal, I have a. Amazon ministry wish list for things that I use a lot, like batteries, guitar strings, and stuff like that. If you purchase them, it's shipped directly to me. So that's how that works. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher.